We tra traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. And I'm sure like many of them, we would have been in the same situation where we would have been tired and we would have been worn. They had camped out at Mount Herod for about one year. However, they needed reminding that this was not their place of promise, but just their place of preparation. God told Moses, I want you to make a clarion call to the children of Israel that the land before you, so you need to get up and go. So many times in our lives, we like to get stuck in the rut. We like to get stuck in a place that we think is better than what we were before. But there's a time when as you have to move and the clarion call has been called by our leader. We need to move and move forward together. If you find yourself camping out in places that have become comfort zones, if you stay there too long, you begin to see your pup tent looking like a palace. And so you got to get up and move because we are no longer, we're not people who have been called to stay in one place, but we've been called to continue to move forward and carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not squatters, but we are soldiers in the army of God. So you can't get stuck in a rut. You can't get stuck in the place that the devil like to keep you there, but you got to get up, shake yourself out and go and possess the land. If you stay there too long, you will lose your identity and you begin to misidentify yourself as a squatter one who has taken over a position that illegally does not belong to you. See, God has given us places for us, and he's told us to walk on those places and co command the territory to be yours. And so when you are a faith walker, and that's who you are because God has called us into this place, we are faith walkers. And faith walkers have to get used to being comfortable being uncomfortable. See, if you're a faith walker, you're going to step out of the boat like Peter did. It gets a little uncomfortable if you're a faith walker. But when you're a walker by faith, you have to understand you got to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable because it's going to take you into some places you've never been before. Faith's going to take you to some levels that you've never seen before. Faith is going to take you to some spirits that you have never experienced before. But if you just live by faith, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And without faith, you cannot please God. So many times we're trying to get pleasing God by the things that we do, but you're not going to please him by your works. You can only please him by faith. It's time to move. There's a threat of not moving. If you don't move, it'll be like a stagnant river. It breeds mosquitoes, diseases, and death. If you don't move, you're going to be like an unmoved vehicle. Eventually, you're going to rush yourself out. If you don't move, you're going to be like a person who lies in the bed and develop bed sores. If you don't move, you're going to be like the person who won't, not can't, but won't go to work. You become lazy in your spirit. If you don't move, see, the devil can get to you if you don't move. But if you keep on moving forward, if you will get up and just move forward, you can take hold of everything that God has designed and predestined for you. The clarion call has been made. There are promises that are ahead of us. There are promises that we have not been able to obtain yet. So don't get stuck here. This is not as good as it gets. I know they told you that you're better off than what you used to be, but this is not as good as it's going to get. It's going to get better. It's, I mean, if you trust in the Lord, not lean into your own understanding, and in all thy ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Oh, it's going to get better. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. He said that. He said that. He's read the scripture there. Paul said that I have not already obtained. I have not already uphold these things, but I press towards the mark. You got to learn how to press. You got to press past yourself. You got to press past your fears. You got to press past your doubts so that you can get a hold of what God has just for you. Why? Because he told you in his word that he wants you to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding, working on the works of the Lord. For your labor is not in vain. So keep pressing for your blessings. Keep striving for success. If you got to skip to the promised land, then get to skipping. If you got to walk to the promised land, get to walking. If you got to limp to the promised land, then go ahead and limp. If you got to crawl to the promised land, make up in your mind that I'm not going to go backwards, but I'm moving forward. Because what God has for me, it is.
is for me. He promised him that I will pour out unto you blessings that you won't even have to overflow. I promise to you, I'll do exceeding and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. I promise you, I will bless you in the field. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless your coming. I'll bless your going. He promised you that you will prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. So I need for you to understand that behold, I set a land before you. Go in and possess the land. Go, 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 go. I promised the Lord that I would hold out, hold out, hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out and meet him in Galilee. the Lord, that I would hold out, that I would hold Evangelist Misha Maynard. I met her when she was 14 years old. She's a product of great parents. Her father has provided strong leadership. And strong leadership causes people to be encouraged. And when you encourage, you gain fervor and strength. And when you're encouraged, it builds character. And when you have character, you can stay together, move forward, and not get the bed sores. But in order to do that, you've got to harvest your inspiration. And let God continue to make you triumph because he's promised to do that. I want to invite you tomorrow to come. 
Tomorrow is Woman's Day. And we're going to have a workshop and lunch and breakfast. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to have love shown. We're going to appreciate somebody who turned 90 years old. And we're going to share with each other the goodness that God has provided for us. I want to appreciate all of you. The house has been addressed. But I want to appreciate those that work closely with me. I want to especially appreciate Dr. Maynard. Without Dr. Maynard's positive spirit, I would not be able to work with her husband freely. I work freely, without intimidation. That's something to be able to say. Because many of you work, but you work under constraints and restrictions and pressure. And pressure breaks down your self-esteem. And when your self-esteem breaks down, you're ineffective because the weakness shows. But our self-esteem is lifted because we love each other. And the district missionaries who are sitting here, and some of them are not here, but these are the people that make the woman's department flow. And I want to appreciate every female worker, and I praise God for all of you. I've lived long enough to know that nothing matters but love. And love takes care of everything. Because Jesus is love. And since Jesus is love, then everything is taken care of through Jesus. And when we love one another, everything is, you little young preachers say, is taken care of. I'm talking about these three young, aren't you all three young preachers right here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> see, when you get together and love each other and see each other's heart, you won't be intimidated by each other. So you don't have that competition that we develop. We'll have that camaraderie and the fellowship that builds the body of Christ. And that's what our bishop has done. He has built character in the people of God so we can harvest that inspiration. God bless you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
he shall be kept. So when I Does it matter what may come my way? Because I'm covered by his blood. Even when Satan seems to rage by God's hand,
past two services, praise God. I've been in, under the direction, the day services, which is Monday and today's service, as well as last night's service has been under the direction of our AIM president, Superintendent Larry J. Christman II. He's done a wonderful job. Amen. And that covered the aim part of our uh, triad. In, in Church of God in Christ, we usually have three to four conferences one whole week. The AIM conference, one whole week. The women's conference, one whole week. Holy Convocation, one whole week. But our visionary leader decided to combine all those conferences into one triad. <laughs> I believe we can praise God better than that. <laughs> praise God. And this portion will be comp uh, was completed today. And he's a gentleman who's going to come now and receive the offering with the ministry given. And following him would be the jurisdictional secretary of Tennessee 4th, which is Superintendent Pastor Donald Chisholm. Receive our AIM chairman at this time. Come on now, put those hands together and give God some praise. Come on and give God some praise. Isn't he worthy to be praised? From the rising of the sun to the setting of that same sun. Our Lord, he is worthy to be praised. We are indeed grateful to be in the house of God one more time. Uh, the saints used to say, just glad to be in that number one more time. And I'm grateful to be in his house once again. There's no other place I'd rather be than to be in the house of the Lord just giving him some praise. That's why I enter his gates with thanksgiving and I enter his courts with praise. I'm thankful unto him for the Lord is good. Has God been good to anybody out there? I wish I was in the right house. I said, has the Lord been good to anybody out there? You ought to show forth his goodness if the Lord has been good to somebody you ought to let somebody know that I'm not afraid to tell somebody else how good my God has been. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If God's been good to you, why don't you just yell out glory one time? On this time, I want you to say it like you mean it. Just say glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank God. My God is good, and I'm just grateful to what he means to me. I don't mean to intrude upon your time, but I'm just letting you know that as a product of my own thankfulness and my own gratefulness, that sometimes I just feel praise bubbling up on the inside. And every once in a while, I can't help but just yell out, Hallelujah! Somebody touch your neighbor and say, I don't mean to bother you, but I have a praise on the inside. And when I think of the goodness, Take your seat if you can. I, I, I know what my assignment is tonight. Mm.
Touch your neighbor and say, I know he's been good. I know that he's been good. Take your seat. touch your neighbor and say, can you feel that? <laughs> Amen. Can you? Can you feel that? I don't want to walk into some a church and not feel the presence of the Lord in the building. So ask him again, say, can you feel that? Amen. The presence of the Lord is here and we are most grateful for his presence. Amen. We honor God for his presence and and then to our jurisdictional bishop and to our jurisdictional supervisor of women. 
and to the first lady of our jurisdiction, to our administrative assistants and superintendents, pastors, missionaries, and to our great guest minister who will bring the gospel on tonight. We certainly look forward to hearing from him on tonight and from his choir. Amen. We thank God for them coming and sharing this celebration on this week. If, if you've been here, haven't you been blessed on this week already? Haven't you been blessed of God? Amen. We certainly have been blessed. Amen. We know that we were blessed by our minister on last night. He tried to tear, tear down the house. Amen. And we tried to put it back together so that we be ready for tonight. Is that right? Amen. And we are thankful for what God has already done. Well, saints of God, as you've been instructed, it's offering time. I pray that you have already <laughs> begun. It's really been a pleasure being the facilitator and uh, just being a part of this worship facility. I'm, I have great expectations, and God always meets us at the point of our expectation for the rest of this service. The service is now in the hands of our jurisdictional bishop, Bishop Maynard, and the guest speaker. Would you please stand and receive our leader, God's man for this hour, Bishop Jerry L. Maynard. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Something great must have happened for him to want to go back. And I'm going to tell you, I have experienced things with God in the house of the Lord that causes me to want to come back and to be in the presence of the Lord and to be with you, God's people. It's great to be here. I know my responsibility tonight. I'm supposed to have remarks, and when I get through with having remarks, I am supposed to present and or introduce our speaker. But I feel that I don't need to say much because I'm really ready to hear the speaker. All of the work of AIM, I have to say this, all of the work of AIM and the chairman of AIM and those persons who work with AIM to bring us yesterday and today, they, when the offering was raised tonight, that was the end of the AIM convention. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so now we move just for a moment into the convocation and then tomorrow we're going to the women's convention and we'll do the same thing. But I'm just glad to be here. I thought that we would have a great time in Nashville, Tennessee with the triad for the very first time that we've had a triad out of Memphis and is here in Nashville. And we're in Nashville, and we're glad that we're here. We did understand that there would be those who would come from Memphis, and some would be late coming. Others of you would come early, and we're most appreciative of that. But I also thought that I wanted to do something. I wanted to invite some of the best preachers that we have in Nashville to <laughs> preach for us. And I called myself inviting them. Uh, we had praised God for Dr. Faison last night. <laughs> and uh, we enjoyed him immensely. But we have a person tonight who is going to bring the word of God unto us. And we are going to experience a great move of God as he speaks to us as God ordains. Unlike last night, I had never heard Dr. Faison preach a message. I've heard him speak, and uh, but I've heard this man speak. And when I listened to him speak, I was sort of like the woman in the Bible. I know that she wasn't just a woman. She was a queen. But the half has never been told. When I heard him speak, I said, wow. <laughs> uh, 
Not only is he a, a, an outstanding speaker, but a man of God who has proven himself in ministry in the city of Nashville and has done great things with regard to the community, working with the community to make sure that people who are uh, permanently tan might have a good place within the city to exercise their talent and their abilities. He's pastoring a tremendous church in the city of Nashville. I believe it's called Mount Gilead. I think that's the name of it. And since it's Mount Gilead, last night they said meet us at the Grove. I don't know if you're telling us to meet you at the mountain or what, but anyway. <laughs> meet you at the mountain. But my God, uh, he is anointed of the Lord. He's uh, involved in the community. Uh, he loves the people of God, and he loves God. And I felt that we who are uh, in the city of Nashville, uh, somehow I believe that we need to come together and not feel that because I'm Kojic and and you're Baptist and somebody else is Methodist and somebody else is independent and somebody else is whatever they may be, that we should stand off from each other. I believe that we should come together and fight the devil and let the devil know that he has no place in our lives and in the city of Nashville. And if you don't believe we need to get together, you haven't heard Trump say anything. But you're going to hear a word of God. Uh, he and my son's uh, son, rather, are great friends, and I started to let you br bring him tonight. But he said, oh, no, okay. <laughs> Thou art in charge, amen. All right. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, but he's going to bring a great word. But before he comes, this great choir. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're in for a treat from this choir. And uh, we're going we're gonna to worship God with them as, uh, as they sing. And when they have finished singing, the next voice that you will hear will be that of our outstanding guest tonight, our brother, uh, God's servant, and our friend, uh, the pastor of Mount Gilead, Breonna Mitchell.
Lord, how we honor and thank you and praise your name this night for who you are, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that has been shown toward us. We are tonight thankful. We're not worthy of what you have done for us, but the least we can say is thank you tonight. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you that we have been saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of you, not of our own works, lest we should boast. Lord, tonight open our hearts and our minds to hear your word tonight. Do as you have done on other occasions. Separate that which is of the flesh from that which is of the spirit. As we impart words of information and inspiration, might your people tonight be both receptive and responsive to the preaching of your word. Pour in me a fresh anointing tonight. Strengthen me tonight for this hour. Take full control of my heart, mind, and body and use it for your own glorification. Those things I've count gain unto myself, I count now a loss unto thee. And we ask it all tonight in the strong name of Jesus and God's people said together, amen. 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 All glory, honor, and praise be to God our Father. You can be seated and to his son, Jesus Christ, and how we thank and praise him for the power and presence of his Holy Spirit that is in our lives tonight. The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. And he is worthy of all the praise uh, that you and I can give uh, to him. Uh, let me thank uh, Bishop Maynard uh, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, his son and I are close friends, best friends. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but we're best friends. Amen and uh, how grateful I am. Uh, I, um, uh, protocol having already been established, I uh, uh, want to say uh, on last Thursday, I came down with, uh, had a bout with vertigo, and I tell you, uh, it has had me the last four or five days. I was supposed to be in uh, North Carolina last night and was supposed to fly here today and then back to North Carolina tomorrow uh, to preach at a conference for Lifeway and uh, I stayed here uh, just to make sure I would be here tonight. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Bishop Maynard, uh, only he and myself and Jerry know, uh, but he has been there for me. And not just in words. I was at a very challenging time uh, in a place in my life about a year ago, a year or two ago. And uh, I won't say everything, but Bishop Maynard uh, came to my rescue in a way, if I would have had to be on a walker and come in here tonight, I was going to be here tonight. I promise you that. Amen. Amen. And only he knows, uh, but he made life so much easier for me, got a lot of stress off of me, and um, that's just the man that he is. Amen. Amen. And he has... Amen. And I know he just had Jerry, but I feel like Brianna's with his son. I tell you. <laughs> if you're claiming, I'll take it. I tell you. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm grateful. Amen. He done something that only a father would do for a son. And uh, I'm grateful for that tonight. So I'm here uh, really uh, to say thank you, Bishop Maynard, publicly as I have privately for what you have done for me. Uh, to all of you all that are here tonight, um, it's so good to see many of you, um, especially to uh, Larry Christman. I used to preach his dad's pastor's anniversary when I was at Boy Street. Then I found a greater grace, and I guess I did it 10 or something years, going down to Shelbyville uh, to preach at Bright Temple. Amen. Amen. And uh, I used to go down there all the time. Amen. And preach the word of God for his father. And it's a blessing to see him here tonight. And y'all don't have to sit crazy on me. I've been a part of Tennessee Fourth, so we're family, all right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. I was with you under uh, the late Bishop Gilbert Patterson. Amen. When he was just the presiding bishop, I mean, just the jurisdictional bishop at that time. And uh, we used to have to travel to uh, Bountiful Blessings to... Uh, on that, on that Saturday, boy, I tell you, getting up Saturday to go to Memphis was a, was a trip. Y'all know, amen. Y'all like, like, thank you, Jesus, Memphis got to come here. I know that's right. 
Amen. But so many of you in here that have known me and all of my preaching and uh, just growing up uh, in the church and my time at used to be uh, Cain Tabernacle at that time, uh, Church of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. So let's go to church tonight. If you open your Bibles with me, amen. There's a book out there I've written a couple of years ago called A Fish Called Mercy. It's a journey through the book of Jonah. And if you want it, they'll have it outside uh, tonight for you to purchase. Malachi chapter 2, uh, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 6. You have wearied the Lord with your words. And yet you ask, how have we wearied him? When you say everyone does evil and is good in the Lord's sight and he is pleased with them, or where is the God of justice? See, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. The Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like cleansing light. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in the days of old. And years gone by, I will come to you in judgment, and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the widow and the fatherless and cheat the wage earner, and against those who deny justice to the foreigner. They do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. It is because of me, Yahweh, I have not changed. You descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. I want to tag this test tonight, uh, a refiner's fire, a refiner's fire. Malachi is a court case. It's a court case. Israel has taken God to court. And they have charged God with being unfair and unfaithful. In the openings of Malachi chapter 1, they state their claim. They say that God has abandoned his covenant relationship with Israel. The times and setting in Israel, Malachi's writing now, are serious. They're in the fight of their lives. Instead of marriages making, they are ending in divorce. Sickness is over the land. The children of Israel are in a rough spot. And they take God to court. They say that God has abandoned his covenant relationship with Israel. Now, before you get too deep in here tonight, we've all taken him to court. We've all went through some experience in our life where we've questioned God. And don't sit here tonight and say, well, we don't question God. He's big enough to handle your questions. We've all tonight taken God to court. We, we've asked God, after all I've done for you, how could you let this happen to me? After how I've tried to live and tithe and given all of myself to you, how could you let this happen to me? All of us in here tonight have sat while Israel is sitting. Tonight Israel has taken God to court. They, they say to God, you have established a covenant relationship with us, and now you have abandoned that covenant relationship. They say that, that you have dismissed us. They say that all the other nations are being blessed, 
and you're dealing us a bad hand. They say that God has been both unfair and unfaithful. And Bishop, when I thought about that tonight, I, I thought about their indictment against God, their burden of proof, Jerry. Is that God has been unfair and unfaithful. Now, now, let me say something tonight. Do we really want God to be fair? Before you get up the next morning and say, God is treating you unfair, let me ask you tonight. Do you really want God to be fair with you tonight? And don't you sit here tonight like you got wings under your clothes and a halo over your head. If God was fair with all of us in here tonight, none of us would be standing in here tonight. Do you really want God to be fair? Uh, he is not fair, but he is faithful. Oh, touch your neighbor, tell your neighbor, that's why I'm here tonight. He's not fair, but he is faithful. Israel takes God to court and they say to him that he has abandoned, I'm a slow preacher, the covenant relationship with him. Which brings a theological question. Because we've been taught to say God is good all the time. And we say stuff like, and all the time God is good. And that's good till it's your loved one sitting laying down here. It's good until you're at the hospital with a loved one and they diagnosed with some terminal illness. It's good until you lose your job. It's good until it's you going through the fire. It's easy to say God is good all the time. And all the time God is good until God deals you a hand you don't want. Is God good? All the time. And Israel is hurling indictment after indictment, charge after charge against God. And what we have in Malachi is God's defense. The book of Malachi is really God's defense against Israel that has taken him to court and charged him with being unfair and unfaithful. And what is God's defense? Chapter 2, that, first, that verse I read tonight. God says to Israel, you have wearied me with your words. Do you know anybody that just gets on your, your nerves? Come on, talk back to him in here tonight. I mean, they may be sitting next to you tonight, but all of us got somebody, hey man, when they call you, say, I just ain't got time for that right now, hey man. When they text you, say, I'll get back with you later on. All of us got somebody, and God says to Israel, by now you have gotten on my nerves. And what God is saying to Israel is this. Y'all want prosperity without punishment. You want success, but you don't want to struggle. Now, I know I'm in some tricky ground here, but that's the danger of name it and claim it, believe it, receive it, blab it and grab it and call it and haul it. Because it makes people think they can live any kind of way, do whatever they want to do, go wherever they want to go, and then claim something and God ought to give it to you, but my God doesn't work that kind of way. No good thing what he will hold from you if you woke up right. And what we have created is lazy saints that want to come and dance and shout and go out and do nothing and then order God around to give them what they want when they want it, when they need it, and never think they owe any responsibility to God. God comes to Israel and says, I'm fed up with it. 
you have went with me with your words. God says to Israel, I've taken all I can take from you. He says, what you don't understand is the relationship I have with you. And he describes that relationship in chapter 3 through two occupations that they would have been familiar with historically. One, he says, he is like a fuller west, out west of Jerusalem, fuller's field, where they would take the acolyte of the wool and use it and make soap out of it and use that soap, hey man, to cleanse the wool until it was strong enough. And he talks about being a fuller, but he spends most of his time in Malachi chapter 3, talking about this refiner's fire. We know something about refiners. How they take crude oil and make it into gasoline for our cars. We know something about refineries. Yeah, how they take water and take it through a system so that when it gets to our tanks, it is good enough to drink. We know something about refiners. And in Malachi chapter 3, God says, what you don't understand is that you want this love and devil relationship with me. But my relationship with you is best defined and described as a refiner. And he says, and he shall sit as a refiner. He shall, he shall sit. Some suggest theologically that sitting suggests the indifference of God when we suffer. And the question could be raised, does God sit when we suffer? And before you're too quick to answer that, ask Mary and Martha. He didn't come to the hospital. He didn't show up for the funeral. He didn't send no flowers. They didn't get a resolution. He didn't go help me in here to the cemetery. He didn't show up to preach the eulogy. And when he does show up, Lazarus has been in the grave four days, and he comes with the life, and Mary and Martha say, if you would have been here, my brother would have not died. Where is God when we suffer? Ask those boys that were on that ship that night. And when Jesus does show up, it's the fourth watch of the night. And I know we get an unction of that when it says he shows up walking on water, but tell me which one of y'all gonna go down to the Cumberland River and see somebody walking on water and gonna dance off that. He shows up walking on water. Does he, Bishop, sit when we suffer? That, there's a word there. There's a word there. And give me some minutes. That, there's a word there. There's a, and the word tonight is, is that in the first place, we miss the attitude of the refiner, and he shall sit while you're in the fire. The question tonight is how can God sit while you're in the fire? And the reason God can sit while you're in the fire is because his sitting says we have his undivided attention. Even though you're in the fire, his sitting says his eyes are still on you. And I want to encourage somebody in here tonight that feels like God is not coming to your rescue on time. As long as his eyes are on you, that's enough. And he shall... He shall sit, and he shall, he shall sit. God sitting tonight says to all of us, we have his undivided attention. He is sitting watching us while we're in the fire. But his sitting not only says that we have his undivided attention, his sitting says we have his unconditional affection. I'm not, I'm, I'm 45, so most of y'all in here, I'm not a, I'm not a byproduct of the go to your room generation. All right. I'm not a byproduct of no TV tonight. I, I'm a byproduct.
product of the generation. My mama says stuff like this, act a fool in public, I'm going to act a fool with you. Come on, talk back to me here. My mama says stuff like, call the police, and after they leave, I'm going to give you something else to call them for. But I'm in a pulpit tonight, and I'm not in a jail cell. I'm in a pulpit tonight, and I'm not in a grave because my mama loved me with a tough love. The reason we know God loves us is because he chastises us. I, I heard one of those preachers on TV um, say that if you're going through trouble, it's a sign that sin is in your life. Now, I don't know what Bible he read because Job was an upright man. Feared God, ran from the very appearance of evil. I wish I had help in here tonight. And yet trouble found Job. God loves us, and because he loves us, he does not throw us away. He only places us in the fire. And he shall sit <laughs> as a refiner. His sitting says we have his undivided attention. His sitting says we have his unconditional affection. His sitting says we're under his authority though. He can sit because the fire's not in control. That went over some of y'all's head. He can sit because the fire's not in control. He's in control of the fire. God, help me in here tonight. What I'm trying to tell you, God knows just how much you can handle and just how much you can take. And tonight, whatever you're going through, God says tonight, I'm in control of that situation. And he shall sit as a refiner as a purifier of gold and of silver. But the question tonight is not just the attitude of the refiner, but notice who gets the fire. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Why not Gad? Why not Dan? Why not Benjamin? Why is, why not Naphtali? Why is it, y'all, y'all help me in here, that it's only the tribe of Levi that gets thrown into the fire because the Levites, help me to say this in here tonight, were responsible, God help me in here tonight, to usher the people, God help me tonight, into the very presence of the Lord. And what I'm trying to tell somebody here tonight, the greater the anointing, the greater the fire. You sitting around here tonight talking about I want this and I want that and I want the ministry he got and I want the anointing she got and I want, but let me tell you something, you don't want the anointing that's on somebody else because the greater the anointing, the greater the heat. Uh, God save us from heatless prophets. Heatless missionaries. How you going how you gonna pull somebody else through when you never been do nothing yourself? How you gonna pray somebody else through when you never had to pray yourself through anything else? How you gonna pull somebody else out when you never been in it yourself? And he shall sit as a refiner. As a purifier of gold and of silver. Have you ever noticed that the branch that gets pruned is the one that's bearing fruit? It's the oil that has the most gold that gets put back in the fire. The greater your anointing the greater your heat. And God save us from saints that don't want to struggle. Because there are lessons that you can learn in the struggle 
God help me in here tonight. That you will never learn if it was always sunshiny days. And he shall sit as a refiner, as a purifier of gold and of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. I guess about, be seated, I'm almost there. About uh, maybe 10 years, see BJ's 15, 13 years ago, I was at home uh, working in the yard. Um, now I'm not a horticulturist, but I was in the backyard. <laughs> working in the yard. And I developed some calluses on my hands. And so I got in, but I had to preach that night. And so I went to my late wife. I told her, I said, Keisha, do we got anything for this? She said, we got one of those things somebody gave us uh, for your anniversary. You know, they give you stuff for your anniversary if you're not careful that you really didn't ask for. But um, they gave you something. Get, get that one going home. They, they gave, and so it was this, this thing, and you put the paraffin wax in the machine. Turn the machine on, let the wax melt. Then you put your hand in the wax. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And it'll make your hand smooth. Uh, but I had to preach. And I, I put the thing in, I plugged it up, I grabbed the paraffin wax, set it down, I read the instruction. And the instruction says six hours before it'll melt. But you know, I'm smart. I'm educated, I've been to college, I've studied several places, amen, been across the seas, been to Oxford, I've studied several places. So I thought, Dr. Maynard, that I could take the paraffin wax, put it in a pan, put it on the oven so that it could melt just a little bit further. Got no help up in here yet. I, I put it in, went in to take a shower. A couple of minutes later, I hear Keisha yelling, get in here. I went in there, the house, the kitchen was on fire. Y'all not helping me in here. I went and grabbed the pan, ran through the house, threw, went out the back, threw it out, came back in, tried to get the fire. And about two minutes later, I'm sitting down and I started screaming. She said, what's wrong? I said, my hand is burning. And they rushed me to Vanderbilt Hospital, 10th floor. Went in first every day for them to scrub it. And then wrap it back up. Scrub it. And then wrap it back up. Scrub it. Wrap it back up. I remember the last day I went to the doctor. On the 10th, I will never forget this about my hand. I never forget it. I went, on the last day I went to the doctor's office and I was in there and uh, I walked in and, and, and there was a black nurse. And she said, Reverend, this your last day here. I said, thank you. She said, now all you got to do from this day forward is take this salve. Rub it on your hand, and you'll be all right. I said, cool, I can do that. I can rub that. I don't have to come no more. And I got to the door, and the Holy Spirit said, read the ingredients. <laughs> and the first ingredient on the paraffin wax, I mean, the first ingredient on the salve she gave me was paraffin wax. <laughs> I went to that black nurse. I said, hold on, nurse. It was paraffin wax that got me in this situation. She said, wait a minute, preacher. The same thing that'll hurt you is the same thing that'll heal you. Have I got help in here with anybody? I, I'm trying to tell you, when he puts you in the fire, he knows just how much you can take. Oh, touch somebody and tell them the same thing that'll hurt you is the same thing that'll heal you. Not there yet. And he shall. He shall sit. As a refiner. As a purifier of gold. And of silver. Why does he refine us? Why does he put us in the fire? Why does he allow us to go through things? Spurgeon says, I know you preachers know him, that he holds us into the fire and pulls us out and puts us back in 
And Spurgeon says that he will not stop putting us into fire until when he takes us out, he can see his reflection in us. If you want to know how long God will keep you in the fire, he will keep you into the fire until you become more like him. He will keep you in the fire until he can see his reflection in your life. He will hold you in the fire. I'm here tonight because I'm a living testimony that he'll bring you through the fire. Amen, amen. I'm there singing. you. Amen, amen. The fire is not in control. God is. And he knows just how hot to make it. He knows just how much we can take. But thank God tonight, we won't be in the fire always. Have I got a witness in here? My fiance is here tonight. We'll be married in a couple of weeks here. But four years ago, I wasn't there. For four years ago, I sat and buried my wife at the age of 40 with a one-year-old child and an 11-year-old son. She had breast cancer and pregnancy at the same time. We were told death and life in the same doctor's appointment. And when that day came, June 29, 2014, she closed her eyes. And I said, Lord, why me? I said, Lord, why are you doing this to me? And God said to me, I can put anybody in the fire that I want to put in the fire. Because I am God. Touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor, God can put anybody in the fire. Because he is God. God can put anybody in the fire because that's his will for our lives. Have I got a witness in here? But look over and touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, God has a strange way of making everything work out for your good. Have I got a witness in here? Is it anybody in the building tonight? When you look back over your life, you can thank God tonight that he did put you in the fire fire because the fire made you who you are right now. Have I got a witness in here? Grab your neighbor by both hands. Look your neighbor in the face and say neighbor I am who I am because I've been in the fire. Tell them neighbor I'm not a heatless saint but I've gone through the fire. I've been through the flood. I've been broken into pieces. Seen lightning dashing from above but through it all I remembered that he loves me and he cares and he'll never put more on me than I can bear have I got a witness in here high five five people and tell them you can make it tonight Tell them you can make it tonight. Tell them you can make it tonight. Have I got a witness in here? Is it anybody in the building needs that testimony? Tell them, neighbor, whatever it is, if it's cancer, if it's heart conditions, if it's something in your mind, tell them whatever it is, the God I serve will bring you through. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Say it. Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah. And God will hold us in the fire. I'm a witness tonight that the fire don't last always. I'm a witness tonight that he that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of redemption. God has never started anything that he doesn't have the power to finish it. 
Never. The greater the heat, stand with me tonight. The greater the anointing. I want to pray for you tonight if you're in the fire. We don't have to go to go through the many vicissitudes of what type of fire you're in. But I'm here tonight to tell you, God is faithful. He is faithful. And you're right where God wants you to be. I come to a conclusion in my own personal life, I'd rather be in the fire with God than out of the fire without him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you tonight, the Spirit is pleading with you. This test ain't designed to kill you. He saves. He saves. He saves. Oh, God, he's the God of another chance. Oh, yes, he is. He's the God of another chance. God, how we honor you tonight. How we bless you tonight. That even in the fire, your eyes are still on us. Touch tonight. I don't know who it is, God. You know that individual that stumbled in here tonight that's experiencing the worst of life. But God, we're there tonight because you love us. You have not abandoned us. Thank you, Lord, that the greatest words in Scripture are, and it came to pass. And we speak that tonight over this house. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. Hold us in the fire until we're more like you. Hold us into the fire until we rather have you more than anything. Hold us into this fire until we become more in the likeness of your only begotten son. Hold us into the fire till we walk right and talk right and live right. Hold us into the fire till we say for you will live and for you will die. Speak tonight, God. And we honor you, we glorify you, we magnify you, we lift your name tonight in Jesus' name. And God's people said amen. Come on, open your mouth and bless his name in here tonight. I didn't say bless me, I said open your mouth and bless his name in here tonight. Come on, shout unto God with the voice of triumph in here tonight. Come on, shout unto God with the voice of triumph tonight. Come on, I know you might be in the fire, but open your mouth. Don't wait till you get out. Praise Him right now. Praise Him right now. Praise Him right now.